In this set of videos that I've been doing about infinity and, in, and infinitesimal, I've made the point that there are, there are two ways to think about infinity. There is infinity, the aspect of infinity and infinitesimal as, as a number, and then there's the aspect of infinity as the size of a set or collection of objects. And so we're, we're coming toward the end of what I can tell you about infinity as the size of a collection of objects. And, and, and what results is something uh, I, I think quite startling, is that there are more than one infinities. <laughs> there are infinities that are larger than other infinities. And uh, this was uh, first demonstrated in the late 19th century by a German mathematician, Georg Cantor. And uh, Cantor was really the first, uh, first mathematician to seriously ponder uh, infinity and um, did a lot of groundbreaking work in that area. He, uh, poor guy went, went insane. They had to haul him away eventually. Uh, we don't know if he went nuts because of the mind-boggling stuff he was, he was thinking about, or he, he did have a quirky personality. There were um, other mathematicians who had the, uh, had the sharp knives after him uh, for some of the things he, he would come up with. Uh, Cantor came up with some very unsettling ideas, and so um, if you're easily unsettled, you may not want to watch the next video after this one. All right, well, in this video, I want to show you what the, the smallest infinity really represents, and uh, Cantor called it Aleph Null, so I want to describe that to you. But first, uh, if, if you saw the third video in this series, the Hilbert Hotel, there's a rather startling uh, end to it. The Hobart Hotel had infinitely many rooms with infinitely many guests, but a party shows up. They have infinitely many buses with infinitely many people in each bus, and yet we're still able to find a way to fit them in the hotel, to all give them a separate room for the night. And not only that, it creates infinitely many new rooms that are not occupied. Very, very amazing stuff. Um, the reason this could happen is or, or this is you know this is possible in the in the theoretical of course is is that um, we're, we're all dealing with the same infinity called uh, aleph null the this basic smallest infinity so let me let me describe what that means the mathematicians have a notion called countability now to count means to take this string of natural numbers which we know in words one two three four five and we match them up with objects. So one, two, three, and you know how to count like that. But, but the, the act of counting is taking those words and matching them up with, with objects. Well, um, we can count in the infinite sense. What does that, what does that mean? Let's take, um, let's take the, the natural numbers, the ones we count with. One, two, three, four, five, six, and and that means it goes on forever. So these are called the counting numbers or the natural numbers. And consider a set of, of numbers that are multiples of 100. 100, 200, 300, 400, and so on. All right, um, this set is countable because I can match each counting number up with each object in a one-to-one -one relationship. This is called a, a one to one mapping, in fact. But that's the idea. If we could pair every individual object here with every individual object, object up there in a unique way, then it's called countable. And it shows that there are just as many multiples of 100 as there are just whole numbers. <laughs> okay, so you might recognize that as a variation of Galileo's paradox that I talked about in the second video of this series. Um, well, it gets better than that. If you, uh, and, and here we come to an argument that Cantor made called the diagonalization argument. Cantor showed that the, the, the set of fractions, which mathematicians call the set of rational numbers, are countable. And so let me, let me construct that argument. Now, I'm only going to worry about the positive fractions. You can make this a little more technical looking and, and make it work for all the negative fractions as well. But let's just, let's keep it simple. We're just going to look at the positive fractions. All right, so Cantor came up with this idea. He said, all right, let's, let's arrange the fractions this way. On the top row, we'll put all the whole numbers. These are numbers with 
denominators of 1. So 1, 2, 3, 4. In the second row, we'll put all the fractions with a denominator of 2. So I have 1 over 2, 2 over 2, 3 over 2, 4 over 2. And then the third row will go with 3 as a denominator. 1 over 3, 2 over 3, 3 over 3, 4 over 3. And let me get this fourth row in. 1 over 4, 2 over 4, 3 over 4, 4 over 4. Well, anyway, you have the idea. Can you, can you imagine that if we were able to continue doing this indefinitely, that we would um, get all, we would list all the possible fractions that are positive. And in fact, there are duplicates since 4 over 4 is the same as 1 over 1 in value. But uh, be that as it may, this is a way of accounting uh, for all the, all the fraction, possible fractions. All right, well, here was, here was uh, Cantor's idea. He said, okay, let's take the, the counting numbers, and I'm going to go up to 10 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. But they do go on indefinitely, on forever. And he said, all right, here, here's the scheme. I'm going to take this first number and match it with that upper left fraction. The next two numbers, 2 and 3, will match with, with these two fractions. 4, 5, 6 will pair up with these three fractions. And these four numbers will pair up with these four fractions. And so we'll, we'll continue this pattern. We can continue this pattern forever. Um, it's unlimited. In other words, we can take every number and the, the counting numbers here and find a methodical way to pair it up with every possible fraction. <laughs> and so there's that countability argument again, because we can pair up the natural numbers, the counting numbers, with every single fraction, then we're able to, to count them. Which means that there are as many fractions as there are whole numbers. Very strange. And, and there yet, there again is sort of another uh, sort of Galileo paradox type of situation. But uh, this is kind of an extreme here. There are actually more fractions, as many fractions as, as whole numbers. All right, well, what do, you, what do you make of that? Cantor said, look, the cardinality of this set, and cardinality means the size of the set. So the size of the number of objects in the set, the cardinality, he called it aleph null. He said aleph null is the smallest cardinal number. It's the smallest infinity that we can, we can dream up. And uh, I'm not very good at, at my Hebrew alphabet. Aleph is the first letter of that alphabet, but I'll give it a go here. Aleph looks like, um, I'll try it again. Let's see, it's kind of like this. Okay, it's not exactly an X, it's, but it's Aleph. Aleph null would have a zero as a subscript. Um, Aleph null is really the ordinary infinity. It's the, 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 the size of infinity that we normally think of as infinity. It's the same infinity of the, of, as the, um, the Galileo paradox, as the Hilbert Hotel of this example here. So you yeah, think, well, how can you get bigger than that? And uh, Cantor showed there are, there are bigger infinities. And uh, these other kinds of infinities, there's Aleph 1, Aleph 2, Aleph 3, you can go on and on and on. These other infinities are, 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 are sometimes called transfinite numbers. So in the next video, I'm going to demonstrate a set which is in fact larger than these sets here. And that their cardinality is different, it is a different size of infinity. So we'll, uh, we'll see you in the next video.